Genevieve is an archivist here with the BC Archives, uh, which is also part of the Royal BC Museum. Her previous research on the Ida Halpern Fawn, Fawn um, is, a, is something I just wanted to note before she comes up. Um, this is a remarkable collection of audiovisual, textual, and photographic records that uh, documented the song ceremonies and culture of the Northwest Coast of Canada. Uh, and in March 2018, uh, this collection was inscribed in the newly launched Canadian UNESCO Canada Memory of the World Register. So these are the kinds of projects and the caliber of projects that Genevieve works on. And she's going to come up now and tell us about her current research project. Thank you, Leah. So I'm talking today about Indigenous data, information, and records, and that's really a academic way to say that we're talking about, when I say data governance, we're talking about information about Indigenous people. And before I really get into it, when I say information in the context of archives, I'm talking about information that could be in a number of formats. So it might be written textual information, or it might be in audiovisual recordings, or in photographs, or in cartographic records, which include maps. And I have some examples of maps out on the engagement table if you want to see those after. So why is this important? All people have records made about them at some point in their lives, whether we want to or not. However, Indigenous peoples have a disproportionate amount of information recorded about them, and often without their knowledge or consent. And this is consistent today, as consistent today as it was 150 years ago. In addition to this, Indigenous people have a very different approach to their understanding of knowledge and information management uh, than non-Indigenous people in Canada and, in, well, around the world do. And this is particularly true when regards to the concepts of ownership. Often there is information in government, academic, anthropological, and other records that contain or represent traditional knowledge, sacred knowledge, maybe information around community governance or family histories. We have a number of national and international standards that address this, including the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's final report, and OCAP, which you can see described up there, that recognize Indigenous peoples' inherent right to ownership, control, access, and possession of their own information. Cultural heritage institutions, including the Royal BC Museum and Archives, have adopted many of these protocols and others that I haven't uh, mentioned. Indigenous data sovereignty, as I mentioned, relates to contemporary data as well as that found in archives. So my research right now uh, is focused on how we can take this understanding that uh, there is information in our records and um, consider how that applies to the way that we work with archival records in our collections. The Royal BC Museum and Archives has been partnering uh, with the Indian Residential School History and Dialogue Center at UBC to take part in a number of dialogues that are happening around the province on this very topic. The Residential School History and Dialogue Center, which is quite a mouthful, uh, is a, uh, an institution at UBC. It's a satellite um, location that is connected to the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation in Winnipeg. The National Center was created, it was part of the mandate of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's report that there be a center established to provide access to an awareness of records of uh, the commission specifically and of residential schools more broadly. So the Residential School History and Dialogue Center started up this series of dialogues as a way to go out into uh, the province and meet with Indigenous community members to talk to them about their center. Uh, being part of a university setting, they had a hard deadline for when they had to open their doors. They had wanted to do more consultation before that. Um, they weren't able to, so now they're trying to catch up. They want to have consultation with community members to get their input about um, how can we present the records that we have in a safe way and in a way that's appropriate and manages to reach all of the important people. I also sit at the bottom on the steering committee for Canada's archives response to the report of the Truth and Reconciliation Task Force. Apparently we don't have short names for anything that we do. Um, and that task force is doing a lot, asking a lot of similar questions in preparation for creating a series of recommendations 
to the archival community on how we can all res responsibly uh, respond to the TRC Commission's uh, report and calls to action. The recent dialogue session was just last week. So the way it worked is when we got, we were in Kelowna, a number of communities had been invited to send representatives to talk uh, to the people there. We split into two groups. There was an academic component uh, where they were talking about academics who were going into communities and gathering uh, data. And then there was the component that was really talking specifically about residential school records and how we can um, share that information in a way that the community actually wants us to. So what have we learned so far? Um, and this, I should mention that I took over uh, sitting in these dialogues from a colleague of mine, um, and this was my first dialogue, and it was really, um, it was a really great experience. It was a really powerful experience. So I spent most of the day with residential school survivors, and the main thing, messages that I heard is that people need to hear the truth. So not just about residential school. In fact, that's only really a small portion of it in a lot of cases. Uh, despite the Truth and Reconciliation Commission being completed a few years ago, many Indigenous people still don't know the truth about their history. So uh, the history of colonization more generally, but also things like the Indian Act, how that impacted uh, their ancestors, their family members, but also themselves today and continue to be impacted by that. Knowledge can lead to healing and empowerment, but we must be mindful not to reopen old wounds when we present it to the public. So talking to communities about finding that balance, which is a really, uh, a really difficult challenge for people who uh, are the caretakers of, of that information. The main thing that we heard repeatedly was ask people who know. So we were showing examples uh, from one of the residential schools that a lot of the people in the room had attended. And there was information missing on the records. And within 10 minutes, we had managed to flesh out those descriptions in a way that we couldn't have done without having those people in the room. Be proactive in sharing information. So make sure that we're going out to the communities to tell them what we have. Because a lot of people, although in the BC archives, a huge number of our researchers are Indigenous, a lot of people out in the province don't know what we have and don't know how they can access our resources. I'm applying this information that I've been learning to uh, a number of different records, but I'm going to talk today about one specific file. This is a government file. Uh, it's about 250 pages long, so I can't get too much into everything it contains, so I'm just going to touch on it briefly. <coughs> it's a file from 1887. It deals with um, a community that is part of the Tunaha Nation. Uh, they were called the Kootenays at the time. Uh, it's a lot of communication between the federal government, the provincial government, and the Northwest Mounted Police. It contains information about land, people, traditional industry and trade, uh, but also really interestingly, it, it includes a multi-page verbatim transcript of a speech that was given by Chief Isidore, who was one of the main chiefs of that region, and this is a really powerful document. The people from the Tunaha that I've spoken to, um, they talk about the, the feelings and the, the intense power that they feel when they're actually uh, looking at those words on the paper. The way that it was described in the past uh, is simply, you can see the name Attorney General Documents, number 17 from 1887, which is not incorrect. Um, I became aware of this file a couple years ago when a colleague of mine had been working with a researcher who was using it for research on the, for the Tunaha Nation. And, um, and she said to me, I think this is a, a really interesting file. It's quite unique for a government file. It has a lot of information in it, more than often would be kept from that time. And uh, the researcher had let other people know, so we started to get more requests for access to this file. So we have approached the way that we're working with this file differently than we would in the past. Um, often in the past, we would say, okay, great, yeah, you can come in and see this file. You need to come to Victoria and make sure you're here on site and follow all the rules um, of the research, uh, the reference room. Um, we prioritize this for digitization because we realized that this was a really important file for that community and we needed to get it out to them. We not only put it online, but made sure that we shared it with as many people in the community as possible, particularly the Tunaha Nation uh, traditional language and cultural department who I've been working with. 
and we're working with them to determine the future use and description of this record. So the, what you see here is uh, some of the description that we have online. I wrote this. The, the intent, the goal is to have a culturally appropriate community-led description. So um, I'm an archivist. Part of what I do is I describe records, but I don't know if this is the best way to describe this record, and I want to make sure that the Tunaha Nation have a say in how their information is portrayed online. So we're working with them to create a new description of this file. Uh, another goal is greater access to records by the Tunaha Nation, uh, knowledge sharing for them, so making sure that the information in this file gets out to more people in their community. Uh, we want to give them control over the contents of this file, so what that means, um, we're going to work it out with them, but in terms of understanding who is, is it appropriate to share this file with people at the moment we have it online, but we're prepared to take it down if that's what we hear from the community. Um, is the information in it sacred? And the most important goal that we want out of this is to change the common narrative around mm -hmm. the uh, events that are described in this record. So the events that are described in this record have really been told from a non-Indigenous perspective for many, many years, since 1887, um, and told so, that it's such a popular story, and I'm sorry I can't get into the whole thing right now, um, but it, they actually have an event every year in Cranbrook called Sam Steele Days. Sam Steele was one of the members of the Northwest Mounted Police who took part in this event. Um, and the event doesn't tell an incorrect story, but it doesn't tell the whole story. And parts of it certainly wouldn't be considered correct from the Tunaha perspective. So uh, the hope is that we can use this file to complement the, uh, the Tunaha understanding of the history and also to provide evidence that their history is correct and that they actually do know what happened at the time, um, which has not been presented historically. So that's what I've been doing. Thank you. Mm -hmm.